What if your Bible were about this size? Just a few things on it. What if they're just ten statements? It's all you have for a Bible. Think you could keep it? Think you could remember it? Think you could do it? People say, oh, the Bible is so complicated. Well, there's a lot in the Bible, there's no doubt. Well, a lot of people have a lot of different views of the Bible. No doubt about that, too. So I just as well, forget it. It's too hard, too difficult, too controversial. What if you have it just on one little card? Well, we don't even have it on a card, necessarily. It was spoken to you by the mouth of God. Would that, would that simplify it a little bit? You sat there and God said it. Jerry didn't say it. God said it. Now the voice of God said it. And you know what I'm talking about, don't you? But nearly everybody knows about the Ten Commandments. Maybe you've seen the movie. <laughs> you've read the book, you know, as they say. You know some of the Ten Commandments? Are they pretty complicated? Do they sound like the lawyer down the street? The part of the first part and the part of the second part? Shall we remember part of the third part? And Nothing. Thou shalt not, what? Kill, not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's stuff. Pretty hard to figure out, isn't it? Pretty complicated. You're going to have to get some religious man to interpret it for you, aren't you? You can't do it on your own. Pretty difficult. And then there's the part about thou shalt. There's some stuff to do. Thou shalt honor father and mother. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Thou shalt have no other before me. Pretty simple. I don't know what wasn't written down yet. It's going to be written down on stone, so that's how permanent it was going to be in God's mind, at least for the Jews. But if you had that little bit of scripture, said that'd be easy. We'd have it made. We'd know what we're doing. Would you believe that in a month, from when that was given, by the mouth of God, these people began to break it and ignore it and do something different? Would you believe that? So yeah, I read the Bible. You wouldn't maybe believe that if you didn't know that was in the Bible because that'd be inconceivable. That any group of people could hear the voice of God and a simple few announcements, so to speak, and in a month... We're absolutely breaking them. But they did. They did. And in the book of Genesis, you Exodus, you read all about what happened when this took place. God gave the commandments, told them what was what, and they said at the end of those commandments, we will do everything that God tells us to do. Every bit of it. We will follow God, we'll do his will, we will do everything, just don't give us any more. But they broke it. And the point, at least at this point, is you realize that the problem is not with the Bible. It is neither too difficult, nor is it too long or wordy, although Peter even admits that some things are hard to be understood, and we understand that, but the main part of Scripture can be understood by anyone. In the book of Isaiah, it said that the wayfaring man, the average, the, the blue-collar guy, if you want to put it like that, will not err in following this book. He might not get it all together, but it's simple enough to know who God is, what God wants you basically. And today it's not very, very hard to figure out that there's a God and Jesus is his son and he died on the cross and he's the Savior. I mean, that's the basic thing. You don't have to get that too screwed up. I mean, it's pretty well understood. It's not the Bible. It's man with his problems somehow not following the word of God. Now, when God gave the Ten Commandments, he was going to give the whole thing about, I guess, all the blue cloth and red cloth and all that kind of stuff. And, and the Israelites said, we just don't want to hear anymore. He's he, he just too powerful. Moses, you go get the law and bring it back, and whatever he tells you, we'll do her. But they didn't. They didn't. So Moses said, okay, I'm kind of afraid myself. Even Moses, who had talked to God several times, when he was in presence of God, he never got over it. 
God was never that old man upstairs or something like that. God was an awesome creature in Moses' eyes who you didn't mess with. But was a God of great love at the same time who loved these people and put up with a bunch. He said, I'm kind of afraid too. They said, oh, you can handle it. You're the preacher. You're supposed to go do that kind of thing. We're the, we're the lady, you're the clergy, and you go do that for us. And Moses said, all right. Took Joshua along. Left Aaron in charge. Said, now Aaron, that's his brother, in charge of the priesthood. Said, oh, you take care of these people, and I'm going to be back. I don't know when or how long God's going to keep me, but I'll be back. And you just kind of maintain things. You've got the ten laws, and you just watch over that, and, and that's good enough. And Moses walked away up into the mountain of Mount Sinai. But a week went by, and two weeks went by, and three weeks went by, and no Moses. As you know in the Bible, he was gone a total of 40 days. But it says in chapter 32 of Exodus, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not or know not what's become of him. What? <laughs> this man. You don't know who Moses was? Moses was your brother. Moses was part of the Israelites. But this man. You know, the first thing that goes wrong here is sometimes people's religion is in the man and not in the God. When Moses is gone, guess what? Religion's gone. When Moses is here, we have religion. Isn't that the way it sort of went? Now these folks were slaves you understand, and had been for a few centuries, and so they had a slave mentality, and that was, we do whatever the boss says, we don't think. Cults would like to have you think the same way. There are cults abound all over, and the Bible talks about them in Bible days, that some people come along and make merchandise of you. They will just control you. You, you. Read in history and say, well, how in the world could people who knew computers so well and were educated could have a guy named Applewhite come and convince them that a comet was going to come by and get them, and so they needed to buy new tennis shoes and put $5 in their pocket for fair and then commit suicide so they go to heaven. Who, how would you think anybody could convince anyone of such a terrible thing but several people committed suicide in that cult led by this guy named Applewhite? Because they don't think. They just follow some leader. He says something, they follow him. And they say, well, we know when Jesus is going to come. And they give a date to it. Oh, I guess so. And so they follow some guy named Miller, maybe, back in the 1800s, because he knew when Jesus was going to come. He knew it was in October. And it was October 15th. When it was going to come. And he knew all about it. And they did read their Bible and said, nobody knows that day. What, what happens? Well, people begin to put their faith in the man, not in the God. Didn't they do that with Moses? Moses came along, and here's the way it usually goes. Moses came along, and, and he, of course, argued with God. He didn't want to be the leader, and God said, you have to. And he, God talked to Aaron, and Aaron's meeting him and Moses, and they met together. Before Moses said yes, Aaron was on his way. God knew he'd have to say yes or, or else. I mean, that's the way it was. And so they met, and they said, it's wonderful that God's stirring our hearts up, and we're going to tell the people. So they told the people, it's great. We're going to have a great deliverance. And they said, oh, so great. And they encouraged, and they were proud and happy and all that. And so Moses went to, the, went to the Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, I'm not going to do it, and I don't believe in your God. And if you guys got time to think about all this monkey business, then you get your own straw for the bricks and make as many bricks as before. And so that's what happened next Monday or whenever. You know what happened about on Wednesday? The, the Israelites said, oh, we should never come. It's just terrible. Things have gone from bad to worse than they could ever possibly be. And it's awful. We don't want to ever hear of you again, Moses. We should never come. I just want you to know something about this. You follow Christ, it might get worse. Did you know that? You decide to be a Christian, you might have a difficulty or other that the devil will see to, or the world, or somebody. But you know you have a blessing inside you never get anywhere else. You have your name written in heaven. You have eternal life. That's all worth it. I just want you to know that sometimes there are troubles when you follow Christ. He was troubled, so he said, he said they didn't like the master, they won't like you. You will say, oh, the people are so happy I became a Christian, and I'll tell somebody, and they will say something that hurt your feelings. Well, I wasn't expecting that. No, probably not, but that's kind of the way it works. Before it gets better, it gets a little worse sometimes, but it's always going to get better because here's what happened. 
Even though Moses was, was rejected, he didn't reject them. And he kept with the king, and pretty soon all these plagues came. The Israelites are over here in the happy land versus fly land and gnat land and, 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 and uh, all the other kinds of lands that were going on by the plagues. And the Israelites were having a ball over here even before they got out of Israel. It'll work. God will take care of his people. There might be some difficulty. Just remember that. You know, they finally got out of the land. And they got down the road and got to the Red Sea. You know what happened to the Red Sea? Oh, what in the world did you bring us here for? It's all Moses' fault. Did they think about the God of the plagues? No. Think about the God that had delivered them? <coughs> did they think about the God that was with the death angel? No. Oh, man, here we are. We're at the Red Sea. And Moses, it's your fault. What should they have done? <coughs> well, they should have bowed down and prayed, shouldn't they? Dear Lord, we're in an awful situation. We don't have any boats, and we don't have any way to get across this river. And we can't get Grandma across anyway. And Lord, the, the Egyptians are coming, and we just don't know what we're going to do. But we know you can do it, Lord, so we trust you. Amen. Uh, they, they could have done something like that, but they didn't. Moses said, now just hold on, folks. Now you watch this. And he put his rod across the river, and it rolled back across the Red Sea. And they got on the other side. Now, do they have a relationship with Moses or with God? Well, it was more Moses, wasn't it? Because they didn't think to pray. And they got on the other side, and they said, You know, it's awful hot, and there's no water to drink. Why don't you just sleep in their arms and say, Dear Lord, we're in an awful situation. Our little kids are thirsty, and there's no water anywhere to be found. We don't know one miles, but Lord, we know that you can provide all things, so Lord, we're trusting you, and we've got our cups ready for a drink of water. Amen. They do that. Didn't you think that we could have died in Egypt? Well, Moses, what is the deal here? We, Moses was told by God, strike the rock. And then they got to thinking, we're pretty hungry. We're going to die. And beside that, we haven't had an onion for weeks. Or the delicious melons either. We don't have anything to eat. We're going to starve to death. Well, why don't you get on this? Say, dear Lord. We are in a bad shape once more. We know you can provide all things as you've crossed through the Red Sea. And you deliver us from Egypt, Lord. We've been rich because they gave all this money to us. We've seen your hand, Lord. You protect us from death. So, Lord, well, now we're really hungry. So can you give us something to eat? Amen. You can pray in Jesus' name, you know, because we need Jesus yet. So they just had to pray. Now, did they do any of that? No, they didn't do any of that. They went to Moses and complained they had no relationship between themselves and God. It was between them and Moses. When Moses saw the picture, they didn't have a clue. So Moses is there to enforce the law. Guess what? <laughs> we can do our thing because it's with Moses, not Almighty God, looking down upon us. Moses went up the mountain where was God, where he always was. Never did move. He's still God over all things. They didn't seem to think that way. Moses, we don't know what happened to him. We have no more religion. We have no more tithe or anything, so we'll just do our own thing. I know we've got these, these laws here, but without Moses to enforce it. Now, like a child, mom and dad are gone. We don't have to clean our room because they're not here to watch us. We don't do this all because they're not here. Now, unless they've got an old good earth, work ethic or something, but, you know, it's just typical. Well, the teacher's not looking, you know, we do, we choose spit lots. They don't do that anymore because Mrs. Hutchings has got them all straightened out. They don't shoot spit lots anymore in school. Kids are no more like that. When the teacher doesn't look, they no more act up like they used to. I don't think that probably changed much. Why do we think that way? If the teacher's looking... It's free time. We could do what we wanted. We'd run all around and say, Teacher's coming. Our religion was not with good. Our religion was not with what was right. Our religion was not with, with a character. Our religion with we were children. And only with a, with a teacher. And the teacher wasn't there. We could do what we wanted to. And we didn't think the teacher would ever find out either, by the way. The Israelites had no relationship with God as they should have. He was a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and that was good enough. But we don't have... You see, here's what happens. We have several 
angles on this. One is that we as parents are trying to get our kids to have a tie not to us and our religion and our church, but to God. It isn't a full folks church. It isn't the grandparents' church. It is Christ's church. And you have a relationship to it by passing mom and dad. Now, we are sort of surrogate helpers in a sense when you're young. We're trying to introduce you to a personal faith in God. And when my parents passed away, my relationship to Jesus didn't pass away. When I left home, it didn't change. The Lord is still the Lord of all things. When my dad and mom could see what I was doing or not, it made no difference anymore. My relationship was with God. Yeah, I sin. We all sin. But it was a different idea rather than, I have to go to church. I have to go to Bible college. I have to go and do this. It's so long, so hard, so difficult. When I, when I get on my own, you, you, when I got on my own, I was introduced to what I was supposed to do with Jesus. I had a relationship with him. I couldn't walk. And if my parents decided they're going to be atheists, you know what that would have done to me? Nothing. I'm still going to be a Christian whether they are or not. Because I've been introduced to Christ, my relationship with him, not my mom or my dad or my preacher or anybody. And the same thing with you. If I were gone for 40 days, would that make any difference to you? Well, I don't know where he went. Nobody seemed to know what happened to him. Well, that would be kind of mysterious. I know he's up in a mountain somewhere. Well, I was in a mountain. I don't know what he's up there for, but he is. Would that make a difference to you? Would it change the attendance any? You know, he's going with God, not with me. Would it make any difference? They were only only with this man. And not seemingly God. And that's kind of dangerous because anybody can come along and persuade you. The Bible talks about with persuasive speech. But you know, you have to go back to the book. I was at a funeral of a fellow that I had thought a lot of through, through the years, actually. And a very nice guy. And I noticed when I went into this you know, and they gave me the handbill that the guy that was going to get up front was called Father, such and such. And I didn't want, I didn't cause any trouble, you understand. But I said, think now, they have a little different Bible than I've got, a different translation, but I've read it before, and I know that Matthew 23 says in their version, as it says in mine, call no man Father on the earth. Now, if that's what it says, like thou shalt not kill, what do you think that would mean? How would you gather that we're supposed to, and this is call the man rabbi either. Now, if that's what your Bible said, how do you think you should react spiritually to a situation? You think that I should assume the name Father? Would that offend you any if on the bulletin it said, messages, Father Weller. Would that bug you at all? Would that make any difference to you? And you say, hmm. Well, yes, he seemed to know the Bible. I guess that that's what he wants to be called. That's what we'll call him. We'll call him Father Weller from here on out. Will you do that? I hope you say, now, wait a minute here. What's this, what's this deal here? Here's what my Matthew 23 says now. You see, the problem often is not the Bible. It is quite plain on a lot of things. The problem is following a leader or a group that says, this is the way we're going to do it. And sometimes you have to choose between a group and the Bible, sad to say. Because the Bible keeps talking about false prophets, false people. And I don't know that this man seemed to be a nice man. I suppose he was. I know nothing about him. And I'm not trying to fault him or anything like that. I'm just saying that when you have a book, and a book says something, that's your allegiance, whether it goes with a person you like or not. If I go way off beam on something, and you know that's not Bible, don't follow me off the beam. Stay with the book. Stay with the scriptures. So that's the number one thing, is they didn't have allegiance with God. It was with Moses. Moses is God, they do their thing. And they had a weak guy to step in, and he says, well, if you want to do it, you can just do it. He was kind of the guy that it doesn't make any difference. He would be a great fellow that would fit into our society of, of acceptance. Everybody is okay. And we don't say anything about anybody. It's tolerance. Before they went to Aaron, they said, we don't know what happened to him. He's his brother. Aaron was a brother. And Aaron said, well, 
Verse 2, break off the golden earrings that are on the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. And some commentators thought that maybe he was doing that thinking they wouldn't do it. You can keep my earrings. Even the guys wore earrings back in that day, you can see. Break them all off and bring them. And they did. Now what you maybe have forgotten or maybe never read is that the Israelites in Egypt were also idolaters. They never got rid of that. They were idolaters in Egypt. So this is not new for them to worship idols. People want to see their God. And God said, I want you to have faith in me. You want to see God, look at me, see God's evidence. You don't have to have an idol. And there was an idol in this church that I was at, and it was Mary, I guess, supposed to have been, but she's not near as pretty as a summer day. Not near as nice as a flower. That shows me God. There's God in the beauty of nature, a rainbow. That's God. It's handiwork. I can see God. I don't need some little crafty thing made by somebody out of cement or some metal thing to tell me about God. I can see God. There's plenty of proof for me, I hope for you, to see God. Moses was up there hoping that Aaron would be behaving himself, and he is saying, well, I guess we'll have to go along with the people. They, they want something else, and we'll just do something else. What did it say in that Ten Commandment thing? No graven image. Could you make it any plainer? No graven image. So he said, bring the earrings. And they did. And he got them. And he fashioned a gallop with a tool yet, in verse 4, a calf. And he put it in a fire and molded it down and so it would be nice. And he brought it out and said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of... What? He just made it. It's not ten minutes old. and It's the one that brought you... How do you figure that? It's not old enough. It doesn't go back far enough. It, it can't be. It can't be. But these people, because it's what everyone else thinks, and, and the leader says so, whatever, okay, uh, this, this cat was out of Egypt. He's 10 minutes old, but we were out, we, we came, uh, you know, maybe six months ago, but I don't know how in the world he could do that before he was even made. And he has earrings on our ear. You mean to tell me that you can make something out of an earring and worship and this becomes God? Now, scratch your head to figure all this out. And then you get in that kind of mess when you just don't let the Bible speak and you begin to follow all the different traditions that have happened. Do you know what? That there can't be a doctrine that is true, that's not biblical. It's too young. If there's a new doctrine, all of a sudden springs up, you know, you knew, all you're hearing about is all about it, it's false. Because the true is in Scripture. Everything that's true is as old as Scripture. If it's brand new, it's too new. It can't be right. Because Jesus is the author of our salvation. We're built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets. If it's newer than them, it's too new. Well, if it's a 10-minute calf, it can't be our, our calf that led us. It can't be, the, it can't be the one that did the Red Sea thing. They don't even think. Because it's what people think. We, we want to do this. And that is the third thing. You see, people don't often follow the Bible. The main reason is they don't want to. They don't want to. They won't maybe say that so much. Some people will. I just don't want to do that. There are people who will shop around. Preachers. What do you think about so-and-so? What do you tell them what the Bible says? They don't like it. They're looking for a preacher who will say, it's okay. All right, now there's my preacher. That's the guy I like because he says I can do it. Is that the way you do doctors too? I'm a diabetic and I want to go along. I, I don't really want to follow a diabetic deal and I don't really want to you know, have to do this or that or not that. So I'm going to find me a doctor who says, you can eat what you want to when you want to eat it, as much you want to eat it as far as I'm concerned. Now there's my doctor. That's the doctor I like. It'd be foolish because you know what you're going to do? You're harming yourself. You know if you got a condition, you got to take care of that condition. You know that. But there'll be some quack who'll say, oh, I'll just take this little pat medicine. You'll be all right. Or sit in the shade or cross your legs or some kind of a thing and you'll be fine. But you won't. You see, people often don't follow the Bible because they don't want to. Do they want to sit there and obey God? No, they want an, they want an idol. And so Aaron makes it for them. And they build an altar. And Aaron says, tomorrow we're going to have a feast to the Almighty God. And they're blending God and idolatry and mix it all up together. And it's, it's all together different stuff. And the next day they had a big feast. They sat down and ate. They got up and played, danced what they did. 
and they danced so much and so long or whatever, the Bible says, you read along here, they became naked. Lots of dancing turns into nakedness almost, it seems like, the way that goes together. And so here they are having this big party. And so the enemies are looking at them, laughing at them. I have no idea how the enemies got close. This is Mount Sinai. I have no idea. But one commentary says, he kind of thought maybe from what tradition was, that it was the devil and his demons laughing at him. I don't know. Never heard that before. But I know this for sure. The devil was laughing at him. Look at the people of God. They left the word of God, and they're going to get themselves in big trouble, and God's going to be mad. <laughs> that is so funny that those Christians have already left their Bible, and they had a little bit of it, they couldn't even keep that, and look at what they're doing. I can just see the devil laughing a spasm over that one. Moses hears this. God says, those people have sinned. I'm going to kill every one of them. Oh, Moses says, don't you do that. You know, that'd be a terrible thing. Egypt would stay. See, you couldn't do it. And he played with God, and God says, all right, they'll be punished for this. And Moses didn't think it was so bad. He came down the mountain. He saw them dancing around, a lot of clothes on. Enemies laughing at him or whatever. He said, oh, threw down the table of stone, and they broke. Aaron, what's going on? Aaron says, well, don't, don't get too hot about this. It's no biggie. He said, you know, these people want, you know how they are. They're set on mischief. We have to give them what they want. Don't you understand how to be a great leader, Moses? you got to satisfy the people. you got to make them happy. you got to tell them they're doing wonderful. Everything is great. you got to satisfy them. That might be a, be a big church of people. They will make a church for the Lord. You can have a big assembly, but things are doing fine, and you can buy an arena where they used to play basketball in, and you can stand there and grin this wide and tell them how wonderful they're doing and just think positive, and they go out the door and think they've been to church and things fine. You can do that if you want to. That doesn't mean it's right with God. Because whenever you read the Bible preachers, they say something like, repent. Now, when you read the Bible, what are you going to do at Pentecost? We've killed Jesus. Well, well, that's not a big thing. I mean, you guys did man well. And, and no, that's not what Peter said. He said, repent. And of course, be baptized as the following of that. They healed a man in chapter 3. I'll send this to us this morning. And they were looking about this guy and what was going on. Peter said, you've killed Jesus. I know you did it ignorantly. You don't understand the scriptures. But I tell you, repent. He got before a king and the king was getting troubled. And, and Paul said to him, he said, I want to tell you about Righteousness and temperance and the judgment of God. I want to preach you a little, about, a little bit about hell here. Well, that's kind of silly. You never get anybody. And the king didn't become a Christian either. But if you tell him something else and he just kind of grins and wants to be a Christian, he never became one either because you don't become a follower of God staying who you are. You've got to yield yourself to the Lord and, and repent and follow him. All Aaron says this is no big problem and no difficulty. Uh, we'll just take care of it. And in that close, you know how bad that was, really? That they couldn't keep their one little scripture because they didn't have a personal relationship with God and because they got misled by another guy and because then they, they want to do it anyway and it was more fun to have a party than to have a repentance. It was more fun, at least for them it was, to, to be able to have all this orgy rather than have a worship service. It's more fun to go to the, to the party than to get down on your knees and pray. It's more fun to watch something on television than to read your Bible. You know, it's a lot easier to do all those kind of things that are not better for you, but they, that's what we do anyway, and people do that kind of thing. And church, ooh. And they'll say, don't preach me a sermon. That's the worst thing that happened to you, preach a sermon according to what people say. Oh, preach to me. You need to be preached to. You need to hear the word of God. God says preaching will save your soul. If you never hear it, you'll never be saved. First Corinthians tells you that. Amen. But Moses said, that's right, Charles. Moses said, is there anybody here that's still on God's side? And the Levites stood forth and they said, we are. We're ashamed of this. We don't like that. And in every group, you'll have a, a group, a, a group of people that will say this is what is right. Ken Glass was talking to me yesterday a little bit, and he said, I don't know why it was, he said that years ago, down in the little town of Deweese, I guess it was Deweese, anyway, Nebraska, here came a guy holding a revival meeting. Now, if you probably 
knew him except a few of us. His name was Harold Buckles. And when you say Harold Buckles, you smile because Harold Buckles was tough. I mean, somebody said, well, he was, lot, he was pretty rough around the edges. Yeah, he was rough around the edges and clear up the court, too. But you tell you the gospel. He started, telling, he started preaching the message. Well, these, these folks just sat there and had church. They never had really heard it. And he's teaching about how to be saved from the Bible and what the church was all about. And so the glasses and the learners and several in that church that came up, well, that's right, that's what the Bible says. I don't know why they hadn't heard it before, but they became, they became awake. Here's what we ought to be doing. We've just been playing church or something. We've never really got down to it. Here's what God wants of us, how we're supposed to live. Yeah, that's great, isn't it? The Levites will stand for it and say, this is right, and I'm going to stand for God. And I'm hoping there's a group of people, by the way, P.S. and all that, in America who believe that we're still Americans and we have our rights and we've got a bill of rights that says we've got some things and people can't take that away from us and we'll hear what they're saying. Because people are telling us today in governmental circles that you have the right to worship. You don't have the right to worship. You have the right to religion. You have the right to freedom of religion and they want to put you in a box and say you can worship in your church and that's it. We have a right to religion in the marketplace and every place else we have a right to speak up what we believe and that's given to us by our, our American Constitution and God besides. Don't want to be a patsy to the, to the stuff that they try to tell you and we will stand up. We still have the rights to do these things. Now throw a gun in there too by the way. We have some rights or we can give them away. We've got a choice. Levi said, all right, what's going to do? We're going to, and in closing, here is the thing you won't believe. There were 3,000 that wouldn't repent. 600,000 people of men and maybe that many women, and they probably all got over and said, oh, yeah, we're wrong. And, and I give you credit, I want to give the Jews credit that they had a big revival service going on, and most of them went forward and said, we're changing. But 3,000 would not. You know what happened? You don't believe this? Moses said, get your swords and go out and kill every single one that won't repent. And some killed their brothers and mothers and children. And that leaves you kind of chilled, doesn't it? That's what God thought. Or he would do it, but they didn't, I'm sure. You know what God's trying to tell you and all of that? The Old Testament generally, you see, is a physical weapon of the spiritual. Do we go out and kill our brothers and sisters? No. I, I, don't, I don't care what your family does. I don't care what your relation do, your, your children or who. We always love them. Christians always love people. They pray for them. They can't hurt us enough. We, we don't drive them away ever, hopefully. The door is open. The prodigal son can always return home. If that's, I mean, I don't care how bad it gets. We still pray for them and love them. We, we, we're not against them. We're not mean to them in any way. Christians aren't that way. We might not approve in any way what they're doing. But we can never, in a spiritual sense, let them rule us. If I had grown up in a home that, that I figured was wrong from the Bible... It would be my obligation to step away from what my parents had taught me and say, well, Mom and Dad, that's not right. Here's what I find in the Bible. And in a sense, I would slay them, wouldn't I? I'd hurt them. Well, we raised you up to be whatever. And now you're a Bible Christian. Joe Anderson was in school with us, and he and his wife got into drinking heavily. I mean, they were, they were drunks. And a guy at work... Started talking to him. His name was John. He's a Baptist. Called him John the Baptist. <laughs> and started talking to these drunks. And it kind of wakened him a little bit. And then a fellow from the Church of Christ came by and he called him and said, Would you like to have a Bible study? By that time, Joe and Barb were just kind of sober enough to realize they needed to do that. And they did it. And they became Christians. And then they decided they'd go and tell all their family how wonderful it was to become a Christian. And every single one of them were mad at him. Well, you weren't, you weren't raised in the Church of Christ. You were raised in this other church. Rob didn't even go to it. You were raised over... Well, here we found the Bible. We just, here's the, here, they were excited. What well, they just found in Scripture, they began to share. This is what we found in the Word of God. <coughs> I don't care. And the sad thing, they would rather, the family, rather than to be dead drunks, than to be Christians. 
And Joe said, I could not understand that. I could not even grasp that. They should, you know, they had these five or six kids, and, and the kids were being neglected because of their alcoholism, and they got rid of all that, and had a good family, and all that, and sober, and paid their bills, and everything, and they wished they were drunks instead of being part of just plain New Testament Christianity. Hard to imagine, isn't it? But the Lord is telling us in this, as they killed all these people, that you don't let anybody control your faith. You never let a child, you don't let a mom or a dad or a girlfriend or somebody say, here's what we're going to do, and it's against the word of God. God comes first. That's the point. Well, I hope you have a relationship with the Lord, and not just with me or some teacher. Hope that you control, well, here's what I'd rather do. Because what I'd rather do is not important as what God wants me to do. That's what's important. And so 460, all the way my Savior leads me. That is the point of it all. We follow the Lord and, and follow him, and he leads us and guides us. So we're going to stand. We'll sing that first stanza, and it's an invitation to us to follow the Lord and let him be our leader and our guide. 460. <clears throat> All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. Gary, I'm going to be 85 years old tomorrow. Amen. And I think this is a wonderful sermon. And I'm going to say you're going to dedicate it to me. I will. Right. From Amen. And I'd like for you to sing happy birthday to me. We can do that. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Charles. Happy birthday to you. All right, many more. Uh, and by the way, I'm working on that little survey and so far you're in the lead you can keep singing did you know that yeah you can so i don't i don't think it's going to change any so you got a better poll than the congress or the president any of them i think but i've, but I've got it so all right thank you for your patience oh we love you charles and glad to have you here and marge too for sure all right dusty would you lead us please Seek ye first the kingdom 